Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and Auto House of Naples on a, well, you know, it's a muggy and crappy Florida Wednesday. It really, really is. Uh, we've had a few days of rain that hasn't helped with the humidity levels. Uh, the water just bakes up from the ground and mists everything up. So uh, what are you going to do? I mean, you know, I know I get a little bit of flack for the weather reports and why shouldn't I? Who the hell tunes into a car review to look at the weather reports? But uh, it's just topical for me. I mean, it's just what we talk about down here. You know, I, one of those assholes who says how about that heat you know it's just what it's all about and that's what we have going and uh, we've got it for at least the foreseeable future in fact uh, being mid-june we've got july around the corner one of the worst months august after that worse still uh, september still pretty hot and miserable and only in october do you start dreaming of what's to come uh, so um, anyway i'm not going to continue with that but let me just say it sucks big rocks uh, had Sebring last weekend. I did well. By doing well, that means I didn't crash into anybody, so that's very, very helpful. Uh, I did rub a little bit of paint off the car, but not too bad, and uh, we'll be able to get to the next one without a lot of reconstruction. So uh, anytime I go to Sebring, especially the short course, and don't end up with ruptured and smashed sheet metal, it's a good day. Uh, I can tell you this, that uh, the birds are out. I hear them all around me. I haven't really seen them, but they're there. Uh, they're up in the trees. They're watching me. They're uh, getting ready to make some kind of a maneuver. There's one right there. And uh, hopefully they don't. And look at this, a woodpecker right there. Uh, oh, he's hiding on the other side of that tree. But I'll tell you what, uh, the minute I turn, there he is poking his head out. The minute I, on the other side now, the minute I turn my back, that thing's probably going to fly down, attach itself to my shoulders, and start pecking into my head. I think I read somewhere that there are several deaths recorded from woodpeckers, so I'll keep an eye. There you go. We'll keep an eye on him. Anyway, today I have this, uh, what is this, a 1994 Corvette Coupe. Uh, this is the C4, meaning the fourth generation of Corvette. And uh, frankly, up until recently, it's really been the most underappreciated, which I think is a shame. Uh, one of the reasons that I love the Corvette, the C4 Corvette, is that it came out directly in my era. I mean, when the first one emerged in 1983 as an 84 model, uh, it had a huge impact on me. I was, what, 12 years old. I was really into cars. I loved them. And this thing, and it was like it rolled out of a spaceship somewhere. It was just unlike anything else uh, that I'd ever seen on the road before. And uh, a lot of people agreed with that. In fact, um, the ad for the Corvette in 84 uh, said, you've never seen anything like this before. If you've never looked up that ad, it's, it's worth looking up on YouTube. It's all full of laser beams and, uh, you know, mist, and uh, the guy driving the Corvette, for some reason, looks like he's wearing asbestos gloves a firefighter might have, and uh, it's just very fun to watch to see what um, uh, to see what TV looked like back then and what was influencing things. Uh, if I could include the video without nailing the copyright, I probably would, but uh, maybe I'll just do a link to it in the description. Uh, but it was a very, very big deal, uh, although on paper, if you just looked at it, if you just looked at the statistics on paper, uh, what you're looking at is a fiberglass body two-seater with a push rod engine uh, driving the rear wheels, which is basically an unchanged formula from the original 1953 Corvette. Uh, and yet, uh, obviously, it was very, very different. But if you go back to 53, and here's a very, very brief history uh, of the Corvette. Uh, you've got uh, two guys. You've got Charles Wilson. He was the chief of GM at the time. And uh, Harley Earl, a very flamboyant and very famous GM designer. And they decided they wanted to make some sort of a sports car to, uh, to not just liven up the Chevrolet lineup, which was a little bit dull at the time, uh, but also to take it to the Europeans a little bit, you know, Jaguar and Porsche and MG and that sort of thing. And they came up with the idea of a two-seat fiberglass-bodied sports car, and uh, it was called Project Opal, and they built it, and they built it and displayed it at the uh, New York uh, Motorama, which was a GM-only 
uh, sort of a sideshow, <laughs> not like a freak sideshow, but a uh, addendum show to the New York Auto Show. And it was a pretty big deal back then. And they put it on display, and it was gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous to look at. And it caught the eye of a young, brilliant immigrant engineer called Zora Arkas Duntov. He uh, visited the Motorama and saw this car and was swept away by it. Uh, but when you looked under the hood, and when he looked under the hood, he was troubled by its anemic uh, little six-cylinder, 150 horsepower, uh, solid rear axle. It just wasn't a very uh, advanced car, you know, underneath its rather gorgeous... Uh, I won't call it sheet metal because it's fiberglass, but, uh, you know, the beauty was skin deep on the original Corvette. So uh, Duntoff wrote a letter to GM uh, and said, you know, hey, I, I love this thing. It's beautiful, uh, but uh, it doesn't have any beef under the hood. I would like to come work for you and help give it beef. And he included a letter that uh, was written with technical expertise about calculating the hypothetical top speed based on, you know, this, that. I mean, engineering is not my strong suit, but apparently the letter so impressed GM Brass that they hired the guy and put him in the performance division, and he would go on to become known as the father of the Corvette. Uh, even if he wasn't the guy who invented it, uh, he was truly the most instrumental guy in making the Corvette a performance car and what it's considered to be today, and uh, will go down in history as such. Uh, in fact, he always had a dream of making a mid-engine Corvette, uh, him and a guy named uh, Bill Mitchell. Uh, Mitchell created a uh, project car that was mid-engined and Anyway, it was a lifelong dream, and finally the Corvette today, as uh, many may know, is mid-engined, uh, you know, following the dreams of those guys, but uh, unfortunately they weren't around to see it. Uh, but anyway, so you've got um, you've got this uh, C1 Corvette that gets, you know, start, Duntoff comes on board, it gets a 265 V8, I want to say in 1955, that was a big step forward, uh, four-speed manual, started to become more sporty. Finally, uh, that led to the 1963 C2 Corvette, uh, widely considered to be one of the most beautiful, if not the most beautiful, Corvette ever made. Uh, you know, I think there's a strong argument for that. And also was blessed by being right in the prime of the muscle car era. So that car, that C2 Corvette, uh, it got loaded with some fantastic engines over the years, including the 427, uh, even the uh, L88, which was uh, essentially just a race motor with a warranty. So uh, that car benefited terrifically from that. Uh, and then uh, what, Bill Mitchell, no, another guy, Larry Session, I can't be got to telling you. I switched brands. Uh, I did something of this Basil Hayden whiskey this morning, and it's nice and smooth. I have to say, a friend recommended it. And uh, it is nice and smooth, but I don't know if it's more impactful than my normal uh, Jack Daniels coronavirus whiskey. And uh, yeah, you know, I'm still on the coronavirus whiskey schedule uh, because I still hear that that thing is out there, even though everything seems to have returned completely to normal, and I am vaccinated with uh, that one, the uh, J&J &J vaccine that kills everybody. Uh, I don't care. I'm, I'm, you know, you never know. So I'm going to keep on the whiskey and we'll see what happens. But I think this stuff is more impactful than the other. Anyway, uh, Larry Shinoa, Shenandoah, whatever the hell his name is, I forget it. But he was the designer of the C3 Corvette, again, with Harley Earl. God, Harley Earl. Long dead. Uh, with uh, Duntoff uh, involved as well. And if you remember the C3 Corvette, uh, it was very swoopy. Uh, very uh, unlike anything else in terms of design, uh, fit the Stingray motif quite well with the sort of uh, big muscular front end and swooping curves everywhere. Uh, but then in the mid 70s, everything was ready to go mid engine. There had been that uh, that project car, the Mako, uh, some other Corvette, uh, you know, stuff going on that was pointing towards mid engine. Uh, and then the Porsche 928 came out, and that was a front V8 rear drive, you know, German made supercar, if you will. And that sealed the deal. That basically cemented the Corvette was going to remain as a uh, front engine V8. And uh, McClellan, Dave McClellan, now the designer, uh, came out with this, the C4 Corvette, uh, which was released, you know, like many Corvettes, it was late. Uh, it was supposed to be an 83 model, 
uh, quality and production and parts issues all collaborated to make that not happen. And uh, it became a very early 1984 model instead. It was released in January of 83, uh, which would have been late for an 83, but was very early for an 84. And uh, it was produced then for, I want to say, 17 months before the 85 came out. Uh, when it came out, it was a radical transformation. I mean, absolutely radical. I remember looking at it as a kid and thinking, oh my God, is that an incredible looking thing? What is that? And then learning it was a Corvette. It, you know, it gave me a little bit of that proud America fuck yeah stuff, I have to say, even back then. You know, <laughs> you got Reagan in office, you got the Soviets, you know, doing their thing, you got fighter jets overhead, eagles flying, and uh, the Corvette was uh, taking, up the, uh, taking up the side for the team. It was doing pretty well. Uh, unlike previous Corvettes, it was not body on frame. Uh, it was what was called a uniframe construction, not a unibody. That's different. That's where the exterior panels... Uh, have structural integrity with the car. That's not the case with this. None of the None of what's painted red is structural on this car. Underneath it is a welded aluminum frame uh, that includes everything, including the door sill height up onto the windshield and the hoop around the back behind the Targa top. Uh, and because they went with a Targa top instead of uh, T-tops, instead of just latching in, that Targa top in the center bolts in and becomes a structural member of the car, uh, which of course makes it tighter. Uh, I will say though, because of the Targa top, it does necessitate the need for the strengthening of the uh, chassis, uh, which led to these very high door sills, which are the absolute bane of old guys like me. So uh, anyway, I'm going to get my crap together for a second, and uh, then we're going to get into this specific car and what made the Corvette so cool. All right, so this 1994 model has seen, since its incarnation in 84, had seen several fairly major refreshes of the mechanicals. They changed a fair bit over the years and a few minor uh, refreshes of the externals, the cosmetics. Uh, the bumper treatments front and back are different. Uh, obviously the wheels changed over the years, uh, but the basic shape, the basic design is still fundamentally the same as the 1984 model, uh, which again was a shockingly big deal when it came out. Uh, it also does have those beautiful pop-up headlights, which I'm an absolute sucker for. Uh, but again, in 84, so this thing comes out, it gets distributed to the car magazines for review and they are blown away. Uh, you have to remember that this was replacing the C3 Corvette, which had really exceeded its run, uh, certainly in terms of cosmetic styling. It came out in Oh God, what, 1968, and uh, it still used basically the underpinnings from the C2 Corvette uh, going back to 1963. Uh, so the whole suspension on the Corvette was almost fundamentally unchanged uh, from 63 all the way through the last year of 1982. And uh, that car was getting very, very long in the tooth. Now, I mean, it was a good chassis. It was a good setup. It had been raced. It had been used in many sporting events to, you know, some degree of success, uh, but it was uh, well, well behind many of the European counterparts in terms of suspension dynamics, engine engineering, that sort of thing. Uh, although in 82, they did have the, uh, what was it, the L83 Crossfire V8, uh, which would be carried over into this new car for one year only, as it turned out, uh, and nobody cared in 84 because the rest of the car was so fantastic. Uh, but that Crossfire injection car, which is considered a wet system, it doesn't directly inject into the cylinders, uh, was a little bit of a letdown, putting out about 200 horsepower and uh, was more or less anemic in performance. I mean, engine control was still in its infancy. The, uh, you know, computer engine control and uh, uh, you know, missions were still getting sorted out and it was tough for GM to make horsepower uh, that would uh, work with the federal regulations. So they decided to go the route of handling instead and uh, that's what they did with 
with this Corvette was make it a incredible handling car. Uh, in fact, the 84 was stiff. It was very stiff. Uh, the standard Corvette would, you know, really knock your fillings loose going over bumps and uh, bad roads. The Z51 package, the performance handling package, would actually just crack your teeth. Your molars would break and fall out. Uh, so I <laughs> had to soften that up over the years. Uh, but uh, it changed a lot about the way the car was built. First of all, it was much, much stiffer. Uh, it was 25% more aerodynamic than the previous Corvette. Uh, they replaced the front coil springs with a monoleaf in the front. It also had one in the back, and that's a lightweight fiberglass leaf spring that runs from the left to the right of the car and uh, acts as the spring, so it doesn't need coil springs. Uh, they used forged, uh, forged aluminum wishbones. I mean, We'll get under the hood of this thing. It was perfection, absolutely stunning to look at, and more like a true race car uh, than anything you'd have expected for the street. And the performance was incredible. Uh, car and Driver in the 80s was a terrific magazine, really top-notch car guys doing their thing, and they did all their own testing on cars. They didn't rely on the manufacturer's stuff. They did their own testing. And when they put this car, this 84 model, sorry, not this 94 model, on the skid pad, it pulled a point nine zero. Uh, you know, that may be fairly normal today, but in 84, it was light years beyond. The highest they had ever recorded before was a, uh, a 920, some version of Porsche and Ferrari. They were coming in in like the point eight threes. I mean, this was way beyond that. Uh, the acceleration, uh, it would do 140 miles an hour. Uh, it would accelerate to 60 uh, in under uh, seven seconds and uh, to uh, 100, I think, in, I want to say 10 or 11 seconds. It put it in the top six in terms of horsepower and in terms of braking it had these big four-wheel uh, ABS discs which was again pretty radical for 84 uh, it would stop 170 feet from uh, 60 miles an hour uh, which put it uh, just behind the Porsche I'm sorry 100, 173 I want to say the 930 turbo was 165 and uh, that was it that was the only car that had ever outbraked it so uh, the performance of the car was absolutely world class class at the time, and uh, that was something that was very different for Corvette and uh, how it had been competing with um, uh, with the European makers up to then. Uh, it's a very, you know, poorly kept secret that Chevrolet and Corvette uh, uh, design teams used the Porsche 928 as their benchmark and uh, that was the car that they wanted to take it to and when it ended up outperforming the 928 in most metrics the Corvette guys were very very happy about it. All right so actually before we just dive into this one here's a brief rundown of the C4. Um, so you've got the 84 which came out. They had to soften that suspension in later years and in 85 they went from the L83 motor uh, to the L98 motor. Now it's still based on the same basic architecture as the original small block Chevy V8. Still basically the same uh, but it had some wildly interesting differences. The main one being tune port injection. Uh, if you remember that big lobster looking thing that sat on top of the hood on the 85 vet and carried on uh, up until 92, by the way, when uh, this LT1 model came out. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a pretty big deal. It also came out of the Camaro Firebird at the time, and it boosted the horsepower from uh, 200, what, 205, uh, all the way up to uh, 230, I believe. And uh, that was uh, a big change. Also, in early 84, the Doug Nash 4-speed finally came out. There was some delay in getting that manual gearbox out, and that was pretty advanced for the time and the point of it was this it was called the four plus three and what it was was a real traditional old Doug Nash four speed that had three overdrives on second third and fourth gear uh, electronic overdrives and that combined you know past and present it still let you have this you know heavy duty nasty four speed badass gearbox in your Corvette but did add the functionality and fuel mileage of overdrive uh, it was not beloved it was, you know, it was cool, but it was not beloved. It had a long throw. It was kind of clunky. And uh, it was eventually replaced uh, to much fanfare in 1989 by the ZF six-speed uh, transmission, which we'll get into in a minute. Uh, but through the years, what, so you got 85, 80, 
six, they came out with the Corvette convertible, which had been on a hiatus for, I don't know, 12 or 13 years. I want to say the last year of that was 74 or five. Uh, so we finally got a convertible again. There was an Indy pace car model. Uh, 87, things stayed pretty much the same. Uh, eight, yeah, actually in 87, there was a Camaway twin turbo option, uh, which was, uh, they only, I think they only made like 500 of them. And that's uh, a guy named Callaway, uh, using with the support of GM, built a twin turbo version that had 340 horsepower and was very, very quick, obviously. And uh, that um, they've all become tremendously collectible. I think there's only about 500 of them. I think a B2K option or something. Uh, it was very expensive, about 20 grand on top of the car. And you have to remember that this car was about 30 grand at the time, so another 20 was a big deal. Uh, in fact, at 84, this car being what 22 grand roughly, uh, it seemed extremely expensive back then. I mean, there was not. I, I remember seeing the sticker price and absolutely getting bowled over. Uh, I mean, you're, I think a Honda Accord was probably nine or ten grand at the time, so 22,000 bucks was an awful lot of money. But you know, if you want to compete with the 928, you got to start putting some engineering into it, and that gets expensive. Uh, but anyway, so 80, uh, 88, you get that Callaway thing. 87, they also also made a car called the Sledgehammer. Uh, that was a one-off, insanely tweaked, 800 horsepower twin turbo Corvette uh, that ran at 255 miles an hour, a record of some sort at the time, I'm sure, for a road-going car. Uh, I mean, th that is an insane number for that year. It's absolutely insane. And uh, that car recently went on Bring a Trailer, by the way, did not sell, got bid to half a million dollars. And uh, then apparently um, you know, somebody emailed the seller who was, you know, Mr. Callaway, and uh, they came together on a price and it did get sold. But uh, that was a pretty neat piece of Corvette history, uh, which now is out in the world again. Uh, 88 uh, brought about a 35th anniversary triple white Corvette, something that I think is quite attractive. Uh, they also started tuning the suspension. They started in 85. They kept going all the way through the end, basically. I'd probably 90. Two, three, four was the last year of them tuning suspension, uh, including having a uh, electronic suspension that had a three-way sport setting. You've got touring, sport, and track, and that uh, uh, did help revolutionize the suspension. I mean, the Z51 thing was always there and uh, ready to shake your fillings out, but when you got that uh, adjustable suspension, it kind of lets you have your cake and eat it, too. Uh, but anyway, the 35th anniversary came out. Pretty neat car. Not too many of those are manuals. 89 is probably my favorite year of the C4. Uh, it's definitely not the best year, but I think it's my favorite because for one, it still has the original body, still has the original front and rear bumpers. Uh, it also has these rather good looking, and I forget what they call them, 17-inch uh, wheels that to me are much better looking than these 17-inch wheels on this car, which uh, replaced it. And uh, still had the round tail lamps in the back, still had that F16 insane uh, fighter jet liquid crystal display night rider dashboard and uh, yet did have the uh, ZF uh, transmission uh, also aluminum heads and hydraulic roller rockers so to me 89 that's where it's at uh, but uh, 92 the LT1 this next generation of pushrod V8 came out and uh, that uh, definitely would be a better car to have uh, in terms of driving horsepower performance and revving uh, it was named for a early 70s LT1 engine that was also that was a little bit infamous actually, but uh, was a uh, you know high revving V8, high revving small block, and uh, that's what the 92 LT1 would become as well, uh, with the aluminum heads and some other work. It actually was down 10 on the torque figures, uh, but up on the horsepower, up on the fuel mileage, and uh, was a much sportier engine to drive, and uh, that carried it through into 96 when the LT4 came out, uh, which was again an evolution of the pushrod engine, which you almost have to give GM credit for this because uh, it's almost like Porsche and their 911. I mean, the pushrod engine was very much being replaced at this point by overhead cam models. Uh, they don't have the center cam with the rods pushing the lifters. They've got overhead cams and uh, either a belt or a chain drive. Uh, GM at some point decided that they were going to continue the evolution of the pushrod, and I think it's one of the best 
decisions GM ever made, and they have made some terrible friggin' decisions over the years, but uh, keeping the push rod was a great one, and uh, they did continue that all the way into the LS motor in the 97 model, uh, which uh, has gone down in history, truly is one of the great engines of all time, so you gotta give it to the car guys at GM for keeping that going. Uh, but in 96, you had the collector's edition, you had the Grand Sport, and uh, I suppose they're considered the pinnacle of the C4 lineup until it was replaced the next year by the C5, uh, which was also, you know, maybe not as radical a change as it was from the C3 to the C4, but was definitely a, a big step forward. And again, a car that was beloved uh, by uh, enthusiasts and car magazines everywhere. And probably the best thing they did with the C5 was lower the door sills because technology let them make it stronger without them. So uh, anyway, going to pause again. And now I promise we're going to get into this rather specific car. All right, so as I walk up behind this car, I realize that I've been remiss in forgetting to mention the most important C4 possibly ever, and that is the ZR1 model that came out in 1990. Uh, that was a very, very big deal, and look at this woodpecker. Now he's right... God. Uh, that was a very big deal, and to me it represented the return of insanity to the Corvette lineup. I mean, it was as revolutionary as any of the 427s that came out in the 60s. It was a very, very big deal at the time. And it was a culmination of a bunch of car guys at GM wanting to make the Corvette once and for all a world-class leader in terms of performance. So they took this standard Corvette, they widened it. Uh, they used 315 series tires under it, which were, you know, if you looked at the back, it was like a steamroller with only the differential separating it. Under the hood, they used a 4-cam 32-valve uh, V8 engine with heads designed by Lotus. Uh, not a push rod, by the way, the overhead cam version. Uh, the, uh, Lotus designed the head. Mercury Marine built it because they were pretty familiar with building really high horsepower aluminum components, so GM hired them for that. And uh, that became a very, very interesting car. They called it the King of the Hill Corvette, or the Corvette from Hell. Uh, 380 horsepower, uh, ZF6 speed, uh, 175 miles an hour at the top end, and in fact, it set a land speed uh, endurance record uh, running wide open for 5,000 miles or something. I mean, it was five, whatever it was. It was a big deal. And uh, it had this rear bumper treatment, which would then go on to happen in these uh, 91 Corvettes uh, across all of them, the square lights at the back. Now, I liked the square lights at the back uh, on the ZR1 because it was different, it was cool, and it signified that this this was not a standard Corvette, uh, but when all of a sudden every Corvette was wearing them, it kind of diminished the ZR1, which a standard Corvette was about 30 grand or so. The ZR1 was about 60 grand, almost twice as much. And when a guy who bought one sees one of these things riding around and people getting the same cred he has for the taillights, uh, it sort of hurt the sales of the ZR1 a little bit. But anyway, that's an aside. Uh, they did capitalize on that look and they moved it to this car uh, and uh, they changed the pipes. It went from four rounds to two squares. That's You see that, you know you're looking at an LT1 car. And uh, anyway, the ZR1 was a, uh, was a pretty big deal. And, of course, they still make versions of that today. A lot of the stuff they make today, the Z06, the Z51, uh, the ZR1, all has historical roots uh, in earlier Corvettes, the LT1. You know, they reuse those names not just for uh, internal work, but uh, to capitalize on performance and successes of the past. So, anyway, we'll pop open the hatch and see what we got. This is a pretty incredible example, I have to say. When it came in, uh, I didn't buy it. It came into Auto House. Uh, it had to be the most well-preserved C4 that I have seen in a decade. I mean, it's absolutely amazing, not just to look at, but to drive. Uh, and, you know, here's a little sales pitch for you. I do reviews on these cars. I hesitate about making them in any kind of a sales pitch, but I'm going to tell you this right now. If you have any interest in collecting a C4, Man, jump on this one. I haven't seen anything like it in a very, very long time in terms of preservation and originality. It's shocking. Uh, anyway, this pop-up glass hatch 
Now, I'm going to get flack for this because the 82 Collector's Edition did have it, but the Collector's Edition was not a real wide-open production car. The, the non-Collector's Edition's car did not have the opening hatch. So this was the first production Corvette to have a pop-up glass hatch, uh, which definitely made it a lot easier to get your crap in and out of the back. Um, I'm sorry for the Dalton. It's a terrible detailer. <sighs> absolutely terrible. Uh, now, they used to have two opening compartments in the back. This one now is sealed shut on the left side, so I presume that's harboring some sort of engine computer or some other electronics, and now you just got one hatch in the back. Uh, but you do have a nice little area back here to stuff people. Uh, would actually make for a great infant containment system if you could rig some sort of a net uh, going behind the rear or the back seats. There are no back seats. Going behind the front seats there. Uh, you could get your infants in the back there they'd have room to you know play around or do whatever it is infants do and uh, they would be uh, prevented from getting into the front as it is now without the net it's no good because they're just going to crawl between the seats and come up and annoy you so uh, maybe something could be rigged or maybe Eckler's makes an accessory for that uh, but anyway very nice feature back there uh, you see these little guys here this is designed to harbor the target top uh, when you remove it uh, the target top could either be body color or it could be this clear plastic stuff uh, which, uh, you know, kept the sun out but let you see through it. Uh, originally, the Corvettes came with this nifty little snap-on ratchet tool, quarter-drive ratchet with a fixed uh, Torx fitting at the end. And you use that to unbolt the structural, mind you, uh, target top, and you could stow it back there to catch some rays, and it clips into this guy here. So, uh, pretty neat feature all around, and that is the back of the Corvette. Uh, I do like the gas door lid. That's kind of neat stuff, although entirely unnecessary. Uh, it has this giant thing that is uh, also reminiscent of earlier Corvettes. There you see the Corvette logo. Uh, since 81, Corvettes have been built in Bowling Green, and uh, they're now, you know, that's where the history of the Corvette lies. I, I don't know if they've changed that. I now have this weird recollection that, no, no way. they got to still be made there. That would be crazy to stop. So uh, GM would never do anything crazy. Anyway, um, that's the back of the Corvette. Let's have a look under the hood. And to me, one of my favorite parts on the C4. So here's this big fiberglass hood. Thank God it's assisted by struts, so that wasn't that hard to do. And to me, this is just automotive gorgeousness online with like the E-type Jaguars uh, of the uh, of the 60s, the way the front end would pitch forward, revealing the tops of the tires, uh, the beautiful forged aluminum suspension, the shocks. Uh, you can't really see the monoleaf. Well, you get a little picture of it there. It's the black thing that's uh, connected to that lower uh, wishbone and uh, very, very cool stuff. Uh, also ASR, which is slip control, attraction control. Uh, that was relatively new. Uh, when it came out, I want to say in 1992, and uh, it made the Corvette sort of an all-weather thing. Uh, because I'll tell you this, because Corvette, I mean, you've got a lot of horsepower up front. Uh, you've got, um, uh, you know, plenty of... Uh, of gearing in the back and you put it in wet roads and it becomes a donut machine. Uh, ASR would make it so that even kind of a crappy driver, even someone as bad as me, uh, probably won't kill himself if he gets into the wet weather. Uh, in the dry weather, if you're trying to do performance driving, you just shut it off and they've given you a nice button to do that. Uh, I do like the way the lights sort of are, when they flip down, they're pointed back at you, kind of cool stuff. Uh, Dalton's crappy detail where he has the... <sighs> God, anyway, the lights there. Uh, you can see that um, uh, the LT1 intake runners are all different from the earlier tune port, uh, but the same sort of setup where the air intake goes through that mass airflow sensor in front of the radiator and sucks cold air from the uh, front of the car from under the bumper. But, uh, you know, again, you have to put yourself back in 1984 when basically the Corvette looked identical and you're lifting the hood the same way. There just wasn't anything else out there like it. There was it was completely radical, completely different, and it just blew people away. Very, very cool stuff. Oh, yeah, this. You have to push back, and oh, that's where you need to be two handed. All right. Close that. You just want to let it drop without uh, slamming it, which isn't that easy to do. 
you know, over the years, the brakes got better, the suspension got tuned more uh, efficiently to be, uh, you know, a nice mix between touring around riding like old guys like and guys on the track also liked. And, and there's that, uh, the four tail lamps and stuff. So I tell you what, let me get my crap in the car and uh, hang the tag and then we're going to go for a spin. All right, well, there's really nowhere clever to hang my bag tag from without bolting it on, so I've come up with this little pathetic system. Hopefully, the police don't find it too offensive on the right end. And uh, once again, let me just speak to the quality of this particular example uh, in, you know, a very uh, non-standard sales pitch kind of way. The clarity of the tail lamps, the side marker lamps, the way that the uh, wheels are preserved, the brake rotors. Uh, it does have new tires because the ones that were on it were uh, just really condemnable by age. Uh, the front, uh, the way the uh, bumper treatments are, the lack of any kind of road wear uh, flies, of course. But uh, my God, what a well-preserved car. Even the uh, clear plastic target top has uh, it's perfect you know most of those things get faded cracked nasty over time look at the headlights man am I a sucker for pop-up headlights always have been always will be I think it's one of the great losses of the automotive world that we just don't see them anymore uh, this was the first Corvette since like I don't know, 1958 to not have quad lamps up front, maybe 1956, uh, but um, yeah, good enough anyway. And uh, again, the way they did that sort of flip over backwards thing was kind of a really cool feature. Love the power humps in the hood. Uh, man, did I like this car when it came out, and I still like it today. Okay, here you can see it has very sporty seats. I don't even believe these are the true sport seat options. Let me turn that off so it stops binging. Nice, uh, but they're very supportive and they do keep everything on a nice even keel, keep you bolted in there pretty securely, even under heavy cornering and are terrific seats. Uh, this is that high sill panel that I'm talking about, which is an absolute bane of anybody's existence. I mean, it is horrible, horrible, horrible way uh, that Chevy made this a stiff chassis. And by horrible, I mean an old guy like me. Some, I mean, if you want to look elegant getting in and out of this car, you have to be Mary Lou Ray. I mean, any impact that you might make pulling up somewhere in your shiny red Corvette and, you know, ticket red, let's face it, the song wasn't about a little blue Corvette, uh, is going to be lost if you're my age and you have to crawl out of this thing, you know, like you need a visit to the chiropractor. So uh, my only true complaint about the Corvette, but yeah, once you're hopped, you fall in, you hop out. Once, once you do that, you're in good shape once you're ensconced inside. Uh, oh, here's that release I was looking for. It's right there. Just gotta tell you what. All right, let's get some AC going. It is humid and nasty. Uh, this has that pass key system GM came out with in the uh, uh, in the mid '80s. I think this is the version two. <clears throat> the first one, you know, was pretty big deal at the time. Everybody thought it was great. Uh, that little chip in here would uh, give you a resistance value that the car had to detect a computer in order to start the car. Uh, then thieves figured out there were only 15 different resistance values, which was easy for them to duplicate. So the value of that went out the window. Uh, you know, it's got a V8 sound, but it's very subdued as far as that goes. They didn't go crazy with the exhaust, which is a little bit of a shame to me. Would have been nice if it was raspier, but, uh, you know, again, at the time, it's what it was, and this is an all-stock car, so. Uh, but it did go to dual exhaust. That was a way they got more horsepower out of it early with, uh, you know, two cats instead of just one combined and coming back out again. And uh, the breathing of this engine is what breathed new life into the small block, if you will, and get some AC going. The hell am I doing that AC here? I don't need too much fan or that's all you're gonna hear. Get a little cold air coming. Okay, here's a tip now. Because GM used shit build quality, and let's all be perfectly frank about that, uh, it's a big part of the reasons that these cars uh, went down in value and kind of fell apart and become rattle traps. Now that can be addressed if you're just gentle with the damn thing and if you don't let your girlfriend in it at all. So instead of, you know, reaching out, pulling the door and slamming it like it's the door in a 68 DeVille, uh, it really is designed to be a nice, tight, little, gentle thing. So 
All you have to do is that. Uh, when you pull it so hard that the whole door panel vibrates, what that's doing is loosening all of the, you know, rather cheap uh, bolt down stuff that it has and making it looser over time. And that's where it gets to turn to crap. So uh, if you're one of these people that, uh, that's hard on your cars, that's how you can make a car uh, go shitty in a hurry. You know, if it's not built to withstand your overexertion of force, uh, and that's, you know, why some early German cars did so well, is they understood that their customers were going to close doors too hard and push buttons too hard. Uh, GM didn't bother with all that because it was expensive. So uh, if you just treat the damn thing nice, it'll stay tight and together the way it should. Uh, door panel wise, all very simple, nice and black. I like the red and black combo. Uh, this is a redesigned cluster and dashboard, uh, which I don't like. I don't like it at all. I much prefer that earlier uh, liquid crystal F16 cockpit pit with all the insane gauges you know a true performance car should have pretty racy gauges that are quite simple so the original Corvette did break that rule and uh, they obviously the engineers decided to have a little bit of fun with it to make it glitzy for you know the non racing consumer and uh, even at the time you know people didn't like it in terms of its um as far as those displays went, car guys found it to be not that annoying, but they found it annoying enough that Corvette eventually had to change it, which they did to this cluster, which I really hate. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. You've got this tack over on the left, which is fine. Actually, you can see it okay. Uh, then you've got the center uh, digital readout, which gives your fuel level miles per gallon. And there you see just 31,000 miles on the clock of this thing. Then over to the right, you've got your, uh, you know, performance gauges, if you will, the oil pressure, the oil temp, temp and volts. Uh, they're reading from low at the top to high at the bottom, which is the exact opposite of what you'd expect. Uh, I want zero here with the needle going up, not zero up with the needle going down. It doesn't really make any sense. And it just, you know, whoever's doing Corvette clusters, they're obviously just assholes. But um, anyway, some people seem to like it. I don't. It's fine. Uh, here you can see the traction control, the ASR. I like that because it may get a little picture of your Corvette doing a, a big burnout. And that's kind of accurate. Uh, your headlight control, your fog light control, your power mirrors. Uh, you do have a tilt wheel which I'm not going to do because I can't get it back down again easily. Uh, you've got your uh, very overbuilt stock here that has cruise control, wiper, and uh, dimmer on it. So three different functions on one stock, and as a result, it looks like something from an F-16. Uh, over here, this will give you, and this will do, you know, again, it's all sort of tied to the original cluster, but it's different. All your trip stuff, fuel info, average 15.8 miles per gallon. Somebody's not been beating this because it just idles a lot anyway so uh, gauges we get English and metric let's get out of metric we're not in Canada for God's sake trip fuel blah 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 uh, I believe this thing that says Corvette is some kind of an accessory I don't think that's the way it came I could be wrong uh, but that's where your warning lights will pop up behind that uh, in fact when I restart it you'll see that let's see there they all are and I want to say that's just a black panel, usually, uh, that uh, somebody has put this Corvette thing over the top of. But I could be wrong. I didn't follow it, so maybe in 94 they added that. Uh, nice, simple climate control. Uh, Corvettes always had strange radios. In 84, they had that Delco Bose system, which was much vaunted, but uh, really turned to shit in a hurry. And frankly, wasn't that easy to use. And uh, I just was never a fan. Let's see if we've got anything on here. Yeah, of course, commercial. So who could be bothered? Uh, you could have a ZF6 speed in this one. It does not. This one has the uh, four speed automatic, which is quite bulletproof and nice for cruising. Uh, but uh, it's not the uh, performance setup you'd want. Uh, over here, pretty cheap little thing where your cup holders are going to go. Uh, I don't know what cups are going to not fly out of there in like 12 seconds. Uh, I mean, you put virtually any cup in there that's not like a 12 ounce beer can and forget it. It's going to be all over the place. Uh, back here, you do have an ashtray that you could fit in that if the guy was a smoker, which I don't think he was. And uh, then you could, uh, you know, have your cigarettes. Oh my God, everything hurts. Let me find it here. Here is that very cool little snap-on tool that I was talking about, a little quarter drive ratchet. Hopefully it's still made by Snap-on. It's hard to tell what this year, but the early ones were. And uh, those will go inside 
these little holes right here if you want to uh, unbolt your your target top which you can see how clear and nice this one is all right let's get the uh, seat belt on there's our power seat adjustment uh, this one has dual airbags that's another nice feature for a collector car and uh, that is what's nice about saying you know I mean it makes me unhappy that these cars that are really things that I think of as new in my era are now collector cars. It's hard for me to fathom. But as collector cars, they do make nice drivers because you've got airbags, you've got modern air conditioning, cruise control. Uh, this is a grand touring car that you can, you know, take from Ford at a Skokie and feel pretty comfortable doing so and still uh, feel like you're in a classic so uh, You know as these cars age as I age as cars get older uh, That is the one nice thing. I mean try to imagine a Model T making that trip <laughs> It's just not gonna happen and honestly a 57 Chevy wasn't much better uh, All right, let me turn off the traction control there. You see we have an ASR off button now uh, That means that if we want to get a little bit tail happy oh, and while we're here let me just pop up the head Lights. God, I love that. Absolutely love that. Yeah, I could do that all day, except they'll probably break. There's a rabbit who almost died. Um, so there it is. This car is quick. The LT1 gives you 300 horsepower. There's some nice people up there walking their dogs, so I'm going to not fly by them at 140. That would be rude. <laughs> and you know what? They're probably not nice at all. They're probably really awful, horrible people. Plenty of those out there. Look a little bit douchey to me, actually. I'm standing in the middle of the street, which isn't at all helpful. Very short shorts. Anyway, um, you know, the steering rack and pinion, it has a really nice sporty turn in. It has a nice assist that's not too much assist. Uh, the car was considered a tremendous track uh, dog in its day, doing very, very well. Not in the dog sense, but, you know, in a real workhorse on the track. And, in fact, it got so good uh, that the SCCA had to ban it from the showroom stock uh, class because it was just absolutely dominating the C4 Corvette was and and uh, you couldn't have that uh, some contemporaries of it that it fought with the stealth RT turbo if you remember that there was a Dodge and a Mitsubishi version uh, the 928 of course in the beginning then the 944 turbo became a real Corvette competitor and uh, so on and so forth so there, there's a lot of you know RX-7s and um, that sort of shit there's a lot of stuff competing with Corvettes does not want to break loose. But it does have nice torque and a nice rev band out of that thing. And again, that's what the LT1 did, was it made the Corvette a lot more revy uh, than it had been. It used to reach maximum torque, oh God, I want to say at like 3,200 or 3,700. Uh, the LT1 was well into the fours and uh, would rev up to, um, you know, almost 6,000 RPM. So uh, again, more tame by today. Anyway, I went to a full SD card there, so I don't know how much went on, but uh, I was saying at the time uh, that uh, rev band was pretty epic and well in line with uh, some of the best performance cars of the day. So anyway, look, I'm not going to ramble on about this thing. I will just say that uh, the C4 has gone from being very underappreciated to now being quite appreciated. Uh, prices are going up. Uh, the finer examples, and honestly, this one is about as fine as I have ever seen uh, in recent memory, and I've looked at a lot of these things. Uh, man, is this car nice. Uh, 31,000 miles, uh, just absolutely immaculate, and thank God, red and black, terrific color combo. Uh, if you want a, a C4 to put away, to drive, to do shows, to, you know, whatever you want it for, start with the finest one you can, and I think you'd be very hard pressed to find a better one than this. Uh, if you have an interest in it, you could go to autohousenaples.com or give them a call at 239 263 8500. And again, I have no particular interest in this car. I didn't buy it, don't own it, won't benefit when it sells, and uh, 
I just absolutely love it. I've really had a fun time driving it overnight, and uh, it's as close to a new C4 as I've been in a very, very long time. So, uh, pretty, pretty neat stuff. Uh, I'm gonna try and come up with some other fun stuff to do. I know that uh, I've been a little bit lax on the videos, and then we're gonna crash into an F-150. Um, so we'll see if we can't find anything else. I'm gonna try to quickly shotgun another one down tomorrow, but uh, you never know. Uh, I have a fun one coming up on an Audi, um, an A8 that a friend of mine, he owns a European repair shop and he's incapable of keeping it going. It just breaks too often for him to fix it. So we have a bit of fun with that. Uh, and I know I still promised you a Cordoba. I promised that <laughs> some stage we're gonna get that going. Uh, I promised you a G8. Uh, you know, my friend Patrick's been really weird about it, but we'll get it and um, we'll see where we go from there. So. Uh, again, this is a 94 uh, Corvette uh, Coupe uh, C4 fun car, and uh, really appreciate you having a look today. We'll see you with the next one. Take care.